Thanks, Andy, for the introduction. Um, and thanks for the organizers for the chance to speak here. I'm super excited to tell you about how we've been using Apache Spark to um, derive scientific insights from massive genetic data sets. Um, as a little bit of introduction, um, the Broad Institute is a nonprofit biomedical research institute located across the river in Cambridge. Um, and although it works on a wide range of research activities, I think um, loosely defined, its core mission is to accelerate the pace of understanding and treatment of human disease um, using fundamental biology research. Um, I'm a software engineer, um, and I'm lead the Hale team. And before I talk about how we're using Spark to analyze genetic data, I want to talk a little bit about sort of loosely how data is used in the sciences. Um, my background, I'm not a scientist, as Andy mentioned. I'm a mathematician and computer scientist. Um, so for the last, I've been at the Broad for about a year and a half, and um, I think a lot about the kinds of tools we should be building to accelerate um, discovery in the sciences. And one of the things that has been in, very influential in my thinking is a paper by um, Turing Award-winning database pioneer Jim Gray from 2009 called A Transformed Scientific Method, um, where he went through basically four uh, paradigms of science. The first paradigm was he described as empirical. Basically, you want to go and see what's in the world. Um, so examples of this, for say, from physics is Tycho Brahe's astronomical observations or um, going out and collecting biological specimens of plants and animals. Um, once you've got data about the world, you start to build theories. And so the next model, the next paradigm, um, was theoretical. How do you, um, examples from physics include things like uh, Newton's laws of motion or Tycho Brahe's students Kepler's laws of planetary motion. Um, in biology, it's things like Mendel's laws of inheritance and um, Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection. So as we start building models, the, the natural inclination is to build more complex models, and at some point they become difficult to analyze um, with pen and paper. And so the rise of computational power over the last 50 years gave scientists a new tool to investigate complex models, um, things like fluid dynamics or what I have pictured here, um, protein folding. And so Jim Gray makes a distinction between using computers to simulate complex models and what he calls the fourth paradigm, or data-intensive science. And so data-intensive science is typified by uh, three, three points. Um, the first is automated high-throughput data collection. So this is examples like the Large Hadron Collider, um, astronomy projects like the Square Kilometer Array and um, the Sloan Sky Survey, and um, things like genome sequencing. And so on the bottom right, I have a picture of the Broad's DNA sequencers. Um, often it's the case that the output of the measurement machines are not directly interpretable by scientists, and so it involves complex processing pipelines to put that data in a form that can be used by scientists. So you go from uh, a measurement machine to a data center, and then an ex a scientific experiment becomes a computation against an existing data set sitting in a data center. And so the, the paper that Jim Gay Gray wrote was really um, a call to arms to build the kind of tools that are necessary to support scientific discovery in this model. And we really think that we're building fourth paradigm tools um, for genetics using Spark. So I wanted to introduce the Broad Institute from sort of a data perspective. Um, our sequencers sequence about one genome every 10 minutes. A genome is about 120 gigabytes, so we're producing 17 terabytes of new genomes per day. We manage about 45 petabytes of scientific data, which is quite heterogeneous, but much of it is genetic data. Um, so to compare that to sort of a data-intensive industry property like YouTube, um, they upload about 24 terabytes of video per day, um, and they sit on a library of about 86 petabytes of data. So, but this is changing rapidly. So um, we think of Moore's Law and the astounding improvement in computing technology over the last 50 years as a pinnacle of sort of engineering achievement but it pales in comparison to the pace of improvement that we're seeing in DNA sequencing technology. So here we have in blue the, uh, the raw single core performance um, available at any given time, and in red, the price of sequencing um, base per dollar all normalized to 2001. And the historical trend is to improve sequencing te technology about 3x per year. Um, so you can see here we're about, uh, at about 10 billion improvement by 2025, which means we could maybe sequence every single human being for the price of the Human Genome Project. Um, I would point out that uh, the DNA sequence information has applications beyond uh, sequencing individual people. We also want to sequence things like cancer tumors, um, microbiome, 
uh, plants and animals for ag agriculture. So, there's, so even though it seems like we're going to be able to sequence everybody, there's lots more DNA out there to look at. And so people have done projections, um, and this is a study from a group at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign about the growth of data in various domains, and they found in, by 2025, they estimate that basically in every area you can look at, the size of genomic data will match or outstrip um, data sets in any other domain, and they estimated that in 2025, it would take about 20 exabytes of storage from the raw sequencers um, to store. That's about $400 million a month in storage costs just for the raw data. They estimated, so I described earlier, there's these complex analysis pipelines that go from the raw data to something that's interpretable by scientists. Um, they estimated that it would take two trillion compute hours to um, process this data. And so, you know, we think of the Google Cloud as being essentially infinite. So you can say, okay, two trillion compute hours, that's about 230 million cores running all year round, and so you plug that into Google, and Google says, are you sure you got that right? That's $6 billion a month in computing power. So of course, this is totally ridiculous, but the point here is that um, because the pace of improvement of sequencing technologies is accelerating so fast, um, what's now a biological engineering problem, how do I build a sequencer that has higher throughput, it's very much going to become, over the next decade, a computing problem. How do I represent this data? How do I store this data? And how do I compute on it in scale to derive scientific insights? Um, so I think that uh, it's really going to require innovations in computing technology on large data to continue to uh, maintain our current pace of innovation in, in biomedicine. So I want to sort of introduce the structure of our data. Um, so, when, so just as a biology refresher, um, the DNA molecule is a linear molecule made up of four discrete bases, A, T, C, and G. Um, and so you imagine if you sequence a large cohort of people, um, you get a matrix where the rows of the matrix are individual people, um, and the columns of the matrix are positions within the genome identified by a chromosome and a position on the chromosome. And each person has uh, two copies of their DNA, one for their mother and one for their father. And so you get two measurements at each location. And so here you think of you get something like AT. So this is a simplistic picture, and it's actually more complicated. The DNA sequencers are noisy, probabilistic instruments. And so the, the analysis pipeline that goes from DNA sequencer output to sequences actually um, carries forward a probabilistic model. So you get both a point estimate, like AT, but you also get metadata about the sequencer and how the data was sequenced, as well as a probability distribution over the possibilities that, that um, are supported by the data. And so um, to put this in context, um, so current studies were sequencing on the order of hundreds of thousands of people. So this matrix will have hundreds of thousands of rows. Um, we're seeing variation in hundreds of millions going towards billions of locations in the genome. So a current large-scale data set like this would have on the order of hundreds of trillions of records. It's a huge amount of data. So what does a scientist want to do with this data after they get it from the, the sequencer and the calling pipeline? Um, and so, so there are many applications, and I'll just sketch one, one possible one, uh, which is a genomic association analysis. So here I imagine that I want to associate with rows of my matrix, which again are, are people, information about their disease status. For example, they have diabetes, they don't have diabetes. Or the result of a lab test, um, the, their fasting glucose level or their blood cholesterol level. And then uh, in, similar, in a similar way, I want to associate to columns of the matrix information about genome biology. So here I have sort of two example pieces of information about GM, genome biology, what gene a given location is in. And here I, I imagine that the stars represent mutations in in individuals that potentially are damaging to the function of that gene. And so here we want to ask, is there a relationship between the distribution of damaging mutations in a gene and the disease status? And we see in gene one, there's sort of very little connection between disease status and the distribution of mutations. Whereas in gene two, we see an overwhelming burden of the mutations are in cases. And so this implicates the gene potentially as a uh, as a cause for the disease and would suggest downstream biological investigation or potentially a drug, as a drug target to treat this disease. And the, the important point here is that um, drugs which have known genetic mechanisms of, of action are twice as likely to pass 
um, clinical trials. So this is extremely important for getting therapeutics into the hands of patients. So what have we built? So we've built a platform for analyzing genetic data called Hale on top of Spark. I think there are three, really three key elements of Spark um, that we're taking advantage of. Obviously, our data is big and getting bigger, so scalability is an absolute requirement. Um, the second point, which uh, Matei hit on uh, multiple times this morning, was that um, Spark helps democratize access to big data by providing high-level programming interfaces that hide the complexity of, of distributed computing and parallel execution. And so many of our users are not trained as computer scientists. They're biologists or bioinformaticians. And so uh, it's very important that they're able to speak as close as possible to the language of biology when they write queries against data sets of this type. And the second piece, um, or the third piece, is um, Spark's extensive support for, for large-scale linear algebra and machine learning. And so on top of Spark, we've layered um, tools for ingesting various genetic data, data formats, um, high-level APIs for manipulating the kind of multiple multi-dimensional data that we saw in the previous slides, as well as um, statistical tools and other machine learning tools that are specific to applications in genomics and genetics. Um, and sort of in the same way that Spark uh, exposes multiple APIs, um, we have uh, most of Hale is written in Scala, and we have a Scala API as well as a parallel Python API. Um, most people who are developing new statistical methods code in Scala, and most people who are using Hale to analyze data are coding in Python. And a lot of our users are hardcore R users, and so I think exposing our functionality in the future may be um, something to do. And so I think there's a, I kind of want to point to a couple of um, examples of, of the success of Hale. And this comes from, is a quote from one of our users, uh, Misha Kirky, who's a postdoc in statistical genetics at Mass General Hospital. And he said, um, in a conversation with potential Hale users um, who were afraid of the complexity of, of working at scale on large data, he said, Hale democratizes access to big genetic data analysis. You don't have to be a bioinformatician. You don't have to know anything about parallel programming. If you have large sequence data and you don't think you have the skills to use Hale, then Hale is probably the only way um, that you could analyze this data. And I think that that really speaks to the high-level power of Spark as infrastructure. And so um, the other thing is that I think, so we've been working on this for a little more than a year, and already we've had impact on a huge number of projects. I think there are um, nearly 30 papers and research projects underway using Hale for their analysis. Um, and the high-level support within Spark was essential for us to be able to um, have this kind of impact. And we're working on a huge number of disease classes from um, Alzheimer's to schizophrenia, um, heart disease, um, and uh, autoimmune diseases like Crohn's disease. There's just a, a vast amount of research happening. And so I want to highlight one, um, one project in particular, which is the Genome Aggregation Database. This is an aggregation of 140,000 Sequence, sequenced samples. And here I have um, the result of when you run PCA on uh, a diverse set of people, the, the first principal components that, ex that explain most of the variability of the genome turn out to be um, a gross ancestry coordinates. And so these are, um, each point here is one sample in the NOMAD data set. Um, so uh, Nomad and its predecessor, Exac, um, are, are a public resource. Uh, you can go to nomadbrainstitute.org to see it. Um, and this has been super important for especially communities that are studying rare disease. Um, so if you have a patient who's been sequenced and they have a rare mutation, which might explain the disease, knowing the prevalence of that mutation in the more general population is super informative um, to guiding treatment. Um, and so this resource uh, is used by clinician, genetic counselors, clinicians, and cancer researchers, and it got about six million hits last year. The latest iteration of this project um, had about 130,000 samples. The, the raw data set, which is a variant call file, which is a file format that we use to encode and transmit genetic data, was about a quarter petabyte. Um, we were able, using Hale and Spark, to iterate on this um, for the initial quality control and data analysis on the order of a week for the first public announcement at American Society for Human Genetics. Um, and Daniel MacArthur, the PI for the project, said without Hale, they would have been totally screwed, to which I say, without Spark, we would have never been able to have this level of impact um, at this scale on science. So I, at heart, I'm a technologist, and so I wanted to talk about a little bit about the technology, and I think 
uh, you guys are too. And so I want to talk about the technology that we've built in Hale to support this kind of activity, because I think some of the abstractions that we're building will have uh, usability outside of genetics. Um, so the first, uh, the first thing I want to talk about is what we call a variant sample matrix. The, the core body of the data structure is the genetic matrix that I just I, I showed before. And then we have essentially two data frames or two tables, um, one that is keyed by the row key, in this case, the sample, and one that's keyed by the column key, in this case, the position in the genome. And then we partition vertically regions of the genome together in the same parti partitions that we process together. And so um, we've taken the kind of operations that you're used to expecting on an RDD, and we've, uh, we've implemented them in a multi-dimensional multi setting on the variant sample matrix. So you can filter by row or column or individual entries. Um, you can map an individual entry to compute new data or transform it in some way using applying some function f. You can reduce along columns or along rows. And the, the way that we've organized the data, it's very important um, for performance reasons that we do it this way because you're able to aggregate in either direction without having to do a shuffle. So for variant aggregation, it's actually just an RDD map because each variant is independent and stored independently. And for samples, we do a tree aggregate to do aggregations across rows. Um, so it's actually very fast. And then finally, we, we support join operations where you can take an externally indexed data set, either by the row key or the column key, and then join it to the one-dimensional table that fits on either side. So the, the second piece of technology that we built that I want to talk about is um, we, we built support for manipulating um, keyed RDDs where there's a natural ordering on the key. And this is something that Spark already has support for, but um, we had to extend that a little bit for our applications. And um, the main use case is that it's very common to want to, as I described before, join databases that describe the genome biology, the functional consequence of variation in the genome, with a data set, a genetic data set, that's orders of magnitude larger than the annotation database. And so if you, if you end up shuffling the main genetic data, it, it becomes untenable. And so we've built something we call the order RDD, which generalizes Spark's range partitioner. Um, and the partitioning is, is preserved through reads and writes. Um, because our data is so large, we can't put it in memory. And so the fact that it's partitioned in a specific way, if we can take advantage of that in downstream queries, um, we see orders of magnitude speed up. And we've implemented a new join strategy, range join on ordered RDDs. So this is a, a sort of the simplest case of uh, Spark join, you, sh you have two data sets you want to join together, you shuffle both of them to get the same elements that belong together on the same node. Um, if one of those is partitioned, then you can take advantage of that by shuffling only the other data set. Um, whereas in range join, because we know the range of values for each of the data sets, um, we can compute locally um, partitions in the smaller right-hand side data set only on partitions that are processing left-hand data sets where they overlap. Um, and this has been very valuable in getting high performance joins on the genomic data. Um, so we're looking at a few future directions. When we started, um, we found we got better performance writing against the RDD interface about a year ago. Um, I think with the, the improvements in Spark 2.0 and the Catalyst Optimizer, that's, that's no longer the case. And so we're trying to take the interfaces that we've built and recast them in a data frame setting for multi-dimensional data access. But get at, but then still be able to take advantage of the improvements in the Spark Optimizer. Um, that means that we need partition data sources. Um, and this is on the Spark roadmap. And so we've been uh, just starting to talk to Databricks about how we can help move that forward for us. Um, and then the last point I'd like to make is that we're really, um, the abstraction, like the challenge of operating on data in genetics specifically and sciences more generally are really going to drive new technologies that I think will be useful to the broader Spark community. And one of the things we want to do is pull out those abstractions independent from our application and release them uh, to the broader community. And so that's ongoing work for us. And who, who knows, maybe in a couple years from now, we'll be announcing the next box in the Spark platform, Spark Science or Spark Tensor or something. Um, so everything we're developing is open source and developed in the open. You can go to hail.is and, and get the code. Um, there's links to our discussion forums. We hang out on Gitter, our advanced users, and our, our development team. And so we're happy to answer questions. Um, 
and I'm super excited to announce that, that Hail is now available on the Databricks platform. Um, we'll be putting links to both the sign up for Databricks and um, for the tutorial. We have a very nice tutorial that goes through importing a public data set and doing some basic analysis um, to get used to the, the Hail interface. Um, and we'll link that from our web page if you don't have time to copy down the link. Um, and here's an example of the tutorial inside of uh, the Databricks platform. And so I'd like to thank the team and our contributors who made all of this possible, and of course, our scientific collaborators. And thank you for listening. Thank <laughs> you.